Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're having a great weekend. I'd like to discuss Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi, uh, a very strange, ambivalent fairy tale. Um, and one that, I, while written originally for children, uh, perhaps as a didactic book, if, if so, it's probably a heretical one. Uh, but one that can be, I think, really enjoyed by adults who, who give it a close reading. Uh, this translation uh, that NYRB Classics publishes is from Jeffrey Brock, and it's a very fluid translation. It captures just how zany uh, the little picaresque adventures of Pinocchio are, and the sense of sort of screwball comedy that exists uh, with it within the uh, various uh, episodes that comprise the adventures. However, it's also it also captures just how strange and truly weird and unsettling the book can be. And, and I'm not just talking about like the, the violence that is done to Pinocchio, to other characters, to children within the book, um, and, and how unsettling that is. But how just strange and weird uh, the girl with the sky blue hair can be. A lot of readers want to think of her as the blue fairy. But throughout the book, um, her character is really quite fascinating. Pinocchio, of course, goes through a series of incarnations from a wood block to a marionette, a uh, carved marionette wooden puppet um, to then uh, later on the, uh, the donkey and then uh, back to a puppet and then ultimately to a real boy. But the girl with the sky blue hair goes through a whole series of incarnations as well across the book. She's young and then she's, she's clearly aged and not just a year or two, um, but she's clearly aged. And then, uh, you know, she seems to be able to turn into some different creatures as well. So there's a, there's a great deal of, of, of fascinating sort of avenues to pursue as an adult reader of the book. Um, and I think, you know, paying attention to those little avenues can, can be very rewarding and, and interesting. So I mentioned uh, that it was written by Carlo Collodi. Uh, it was originally published in, I believe, 1881. And then the, the second sort of half of the book, those episodes were published about a year, year and a half later. And the serialization shows, the episodic nature of the book uh, is very clear. The joints show, which is appropriate in a book about, about a puppet. Um, and it shows, it's similar to the way that the Pickwick Papers or um, The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy, it, it's very clear that those were serialized and then kind of pushed together into novels rather than serialized novels that, that were, were being, you know, I think there's a difference between those. Um, but, but it's a fascinating read. And so we start out uh, with this fairy tale. And I said it's an ambivalent fairy tale. And we'll see why. Once upon a time there was a king, my little readers will say at once. No children, you're wrong. What a great way to start a fairy tale. Once upon a time there was a piece of wood. It wasn't a fancy piece of wood, just a regular wood pile log, the kind you might put in your stove or fireplace to stoke a fire and heat your room. I don't know how it happened, but the fact is that one fine day this piece of wood turned up in the workshop of an old carpenter. So we start out with this hunk of wood, uh, and that's that's a critical note in, in this, as I said, it, it, you know, ambivalent fairy, fairy tale. Um, is It's not filled with kings and queens, princes and princesses. Now, there are fabulous creatures. It has that fable aspect of fairy tales where there are um, anthropomorphized animals. There, there's a uh, memorably a cat and a frog. There are, of course, the children who are turned into donkeys. Um, there's a great monstrous shark. There's a dog that talks to Pinocchio, um, and he has a number of interactions with. There is famously the talking cricket. Doesn't wear a suit or anything cool like that, but there's a little talking cricket that pops up a couple of times. Um, and so there's all those those fable type creatures that you find in a fairy tale, but it's a different type of fairy tale. Right away, Clodi is letting readers you know know, regardless of their age, this is a little different. You haven't heard this one before, um, and so it goes on and. Master Cherry was delighted to see that piece of wood. He rubbed his hands together with satisfaction and mumbled in a soft voice. This log has turned up at a good moment. I think I'll use it to make me a table leg. Wasting no time, he picked up his sharp hatchet to start removing the log's bark and trimming it down. But just as he was about to strike the first blow, his arm froze in midair because he heard a little high-pitched voice pleading, Don't hit me too hard! <laughs> Pinocchio's already in the block of wood before he's before he's carved into a puppet um, Before Geppetto wishes for a son, you know those things that we come to think of from the Disney adaptations This is really fascinating Pinocchio already exists and is alive in some form within the block of wood There's not there. There's not a magic wish being granted to create Pinocchio um, He's there and he needs to be revealed by Geppetto's work. And uh, that, I think, raises all sorts of questions, all sorts of implications, uh, and it's a really critical component, and it's on the first page of the story. 
Um, and so the first, the first rough like half of of Pinocchio, the first fifteen episodes, deal primarily with he, with Pinocchio getting into a lot of trouble. He's extremely rude to Geppetto. He is selfish. He's a punk. Um, he is not a good boy. He is not a good child. He does not listen. Uh, at one point, he gets his feet burned off, and Geppetto has to make new feet for him. And so there's all of these these little episodes that show that Pinocchio really is not good. He never even really makes it to school on the first day. He, <laughs> Geppetto, poverty is a, is a critical theme in this, and, and it's made clear when Geppetto has to go sell his, his only coat to buy a spelling book for Pinocchio to go to school. And Pinocchio rewards that by bartering the book to go see a puppet show where he then is recognized by the, by the other puppets who want to interact with him. Again, uh, uh, an episode, it seems to be like mostly real, um, and then suddenly it zags into fairy tale land with puppets hanging out together. Um, and then poverty strikes again, as multiple times we're reminded that Pinocchio is often hungry. He's, he's truly hungry, he's looking for food, and he doesn't have any. Uh, and Geppetto doesn't have any money to buy food, or Pinocchio like tries to beg and nobody will give him anything. Um, and so the, the poverty is very clear in this, and it, more than once Pinocchio is threatened with being used to, uh, as firewood to cook someone else's dinner, or as dinner. Um, and so there, there's this weird, you know, theme of poverty just lying across the novel. And I think it would have been, I, I think that's something that is hard for modern readers to, to understand, um, and that would have been different for Collodi's readers, particularly as all the changes in Italy occurred. Um, this book being published uh, about a generation after the unification of Italy, and as there were major changes going on for for the rural population, for workers, um, and so that's that's something that I think is is harder for us to grasp. But across those adventures, they culminate with Pinocchio being chased down by a pair of characters who want to rob him, and then they proceed to murder Pinocchio. He's at, he's actually hung from a tree as, as a puppet. They they hang him uh, to to kill him. And again, I said like the, the viol we, we think of the violence that will come later on um, with the coachman in particular or, or miniman in particular. Um, but early on the violence is there. Uh, one, one animal like has its hand bitten off and of course Pinocchio is murdered. Um, and it's like in fairly graphic detail. Little by little his eyes grew dim and though he felt himself approaching death he continued to hope that at any moment some merciful soul might yet come to his aid. But when after waiting and waiting he saw that no one was coming, no one at all, then he thought of his poor father, and there at death's door he stammered, Oh, if only you were here, Daddy. He lacked the strength to say another word. His eyes closed, his mouth opened, his legs straightened, and then after a tremendous shudder, he went completely limp. Um, and so that closes this first arc of Pinocchio, but that closes it and it gives, I think, a critical insight into one of the weird heretical readings that exists within this book. I had mentioned that it's sort of a didactic book. Collodi had, um, had written several of those for children, sort of these obey your parents, be good, follow the rules. And Pinocchio proceeds to go and break all of the rules. He's terrible to everybody. He's terrible to his father. He's greedy and avaricious. And, you know, ultimately he comes to an untimely end with that. Uh, but that weird, as he's dying, oh, if only you were here, daddy, uh, calls to mind Christ on the cross. And there is a weird parallel where we have, uh, Pinocchio and Geppetto. And Pinocchio is this son of Geppetto who is a woodworker, a carpenter, kind of like Joseph, even the name. Um, and then there's the, uh, the beautiful girl with the sky blue hair and the fact that often, uh, the Virgin Mary would, would have the color blue associated with her in painting and in art. And so there is this weird uh, uh, Christology going on with Pinocchio, except that Pinocchio is not <laughs> dying for anyone else's sins and is generally like awful to people. Um, and so, like I said, it has this weird, you know, heretical like reading um, going on. And of course, Pinocchio is not quite dead. There's shades of the, the Princess Bride uh, having <laughs> a parallel to Pinocchio where the three animals are called by the beautiful girl with the sky blue hair who has come to her window, moved to pity by the sight of that poor wretch dangling by his neck, dancing a jig with the north wind. She brought her hands together three times, making three soft claps. And then these various animals come and they each give their opinion on whether or not Pinocchio's not quite dead or 
you know, dead, but only just, and, and then the talking cricket, who Pinocchio murdered earlier with a hammer. He threw a hammer at Jiminy Cricket. The cricket, you know, kind of is, is a little sarcastic there. Uh, but the girl brings Pinocchio back, only for Pinocchio to proceed to, you know, not follow the rules again and get into trouble again. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, and so there's a bit where Pinocchio goes and tries to catch up to Geppetto, who's gone off to look for him and his, seems to be lost at sea. Uh, and then on his way back, he's begging, and then suddenly the girl with the beautiful, the beautiful girl with the sky blue hair is revealed again. But it's clear she's different. There, the, the differences are, are there, and they're weird. Um, you remember, you left me a girl, and now you find me a woman. So grown up, I could almost be your mother. And that gladdens my heart, because now, instead of my sister, I'll call you my mother. For so long, I've been yearning to have a mother like other children. But how did you manage to grow up so fast? It's a secret. Teach me how. I'd like to grow up a little, too. Don't you see? I'm about as tall as a piece of cheese. But you can't grow, replied the fairy. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the fairy is going through incarnations just as Pinocchio is. And so he then seems to you know, agree that he's going to do the right thing here. Uh, but that again leads us to, and he goes to school, but ultimately there's the Pinocchio yields to temptation. It's one of the critical pieces of Pinocchio is that throughout the book, Pinocchio in sort of an inversion of the Pilgrim's Progress is always being tempted and falling for the temptation. He resists, he resists, he resists. And then he goes, well, I've kind of given in this far. So what does it matter if I go a little bit farther? Um, and I do think there is that aspect as a moral. Um, but chapter 25, where he re-recognizes the fairy, that becomes sort of the, the moral crux of the book, where Pinocchio uh, is now going to rededicate himself. He wants to be a boy. He doesn't just want to be this puppet who can't change. He wants to be a boy. He wants to live. He wants to grow. Uh, and it's curious that the character he's saying that to is a character that fundamentally does not quite seem to be human. Um, there are ways in which she feels more human than Pinocchio, but ultimately otherworldly. And Pinocchio, who's not quite human, is asking this character, who's a little bit more than human, uh, to help him become human. And, and that, that, I think, reveals this beautiful, fascinating, like, parallelism uh, going on. But then we get what's, to my mind, but, you know, the darkest sections of the book. And um, I think in some ways, the, the part that, of course was adapted by Disney and is truly horrifying that there's a coachman who is abusive to all of these former boys, uh, these boys who've been corrupted and become donkeys, um, and that the, the coachman, or sometimes he's referred to in the text as miniman in this translation, that he's violent to them, he beats them, um, and they go and they enjoy all of these things, and the prophecy about, you know, boys who are bored and do bad things will become jackasses comes true as they grow ears and then ultimately hair. And we see um, that fate, uh, and it's quite dark for Pinocchio. There's an interlude where he's sort of back at the circus, paralleling the early time, the early episode where he runs into Harlequin and Punch, and they encounter him as their friend Pinocchio and want to hang out together on the puppet stage and ruin the show. Pinocchio has failures um, in his circus show as a donkey. And this then brings up another weird, like, Christological episode where he is thrown in the water to be drowned so that he can be skinned and his skin turned into a drum. And while in the water, when he reemerges, he's back to Pinocchio the marionette. Um, and so there is, again, uh, as I mentioned, it can be heretical at times, but there is that uh, Christ type reading where um, Pinocchio is baptized. And that is how he, the, the corruption that has occurred from Toyland is removed from him. Uh, but later on, he goes and is captured by the great shark, where he and Geppetto manage to navigate their way out and then swim off. And Pinocchio's wood can kind of float, but they swim off together. And finally, Pinocchio went to bed and slept, and in his sleep, he thought he saw the fairy in a dream. Beautiful and smiling, she gave him a kiss and said, Bravo, Pinocchio! Because of your good heart, I forgive you every mischievous thing you've ever done. Children who dotingly look after parents who are poor or sick always deserve great praise and great love, even if they can't be considered models of obedience and good behavior. Be good from now on, and you'll be happy. At this point, the dream ended, and Pinocchio woke with wide eyes. I feel like there was a moral there, readers. <laughs> now imagine his amazement, readers, when upon waking he realized that he was no longer a wooden puppet, but rather a boy like other boys. And so we have the final magical transformation. 
um, in what is a truly fantastic, strange, strange, otherworldly book. Uh, but it, I, you know, there, there are so many different readings of this. I've tried to talk about a few, but there are so many different readings, and I feel that each um, has its merits. There's one, one last one I want to mention is there's a weird reading of it where it could almost be felt as an inversion of um, Dante's Divine Comedy, where Pinocchio sort of goes to a purgatory, through a purgatory, and then ultimately goes through an inferno, um, both between his being hung and almost dying and then uh, Toyland, but then ultimately reaches this paradise in his transformation at the end. Um, but there are so many other books, of course, that jump to mind. Uh, I think Italo Calvino was deeply influenced. Calvino was a great reader of folktales. And the folktale tradition is so evident in the little zany episodes and adventures that Pinocchio goes through. Uh, the strange, strange, strange Tommaso uh, Landolfi uh, was another Italian writer who I think sort of tapped into that aspect of consciousness. Umberto Eco is very explicit in uh, loving Pinocchio. He used to use it as an object lesson in lectures. And there's aspects in Baudolino about, you know, characters who are always lying, for example, that feel perhaps uh, parallel to that. Um, and then an, a book that I don't know is directly influenced would be um, Carnival for the Gods by Gladys Swan, which I think draws on some, some of the um, ideas from Pinocchio. I had mentioned, of course, that there are ways in which Pilgrim's Progress uh, is, is echoed in some way, although from a very different, you know, faith tradition. Um, and the sense of, uh, the sense of uh, naughty whimsy <laughs> that exists across J.D. Salinger's stories and of uh, Catcher in the Rye as well, I think, um, have a, a Pinocchio aspect to them. Um, fairy tales in general, I think, were a key basis for Pinocchio, even if Pinocchio is trying to do, Collodi's trying to do something other than a fairy tale in the text. Uh, the Great Fables uh, comic book series uh, has Pinocchio as a character, and March of the Wooden Soldiers really draws on that. We might have some ideas about what that might imply. And I think there's a way in which Pinocchio specifically becomes a key um, totem for steampunk books. The idea of automata, or the idea of you know more than lifelike automata, uh, even in a work like Infernal Devices by K.W. K. Jeter, which is a great, great steampunk novel, one of the best. I think that, that feels relevant to the steampunk tradition. And then finally, uh, a, a uh, right, written around the same time of a boy who got into almost as much trouble as Pinocchio would, of course, be Huckleberry Finn by uh, Mark Twain. So let me know if you've read uh, Pinocchio, if, if you have a favorite adaptation. Um, I, I enjoyed reading it in this translation and kind of coming back to story and, and rediscovering all these different aspects about why it ter truly terrified me when I was a kid um, and, and what there is to appreciate in it as an adult. So I hope everybody's doing really well. Have a good one.